Um, I just want to maybe start with uh, the exit packages, if I can, and the, to Ms Cusack there, the head of HR. Just, uh, just looking at your opening statement, and you had said uh, that a separate and confidential arrangement was entered between the former DG and the, the former CEO. That wasn't normal, I take, to have a separate and confidential agreement, no. So you, you knew there was something that just wasn't right with that. And you said that you more or less took it, took the the D Forbes at our word, and you are happy enough to. Yes, it was a, it was an agreement to release the CFO on the VEP taken outside of the the overall yeah, process, which wouldn't have been normal. No, it wouldn't. No, no. But you were you kind of took her at a word that the the um, the money with the eighty percent to be made up, so you let it go. You didn't flag it up with management. I had, no, I had no reason not to trust her. I right, was in okay, the organisation okay. a short time. So when, when it transpired then that you had no reason not to trust her, fair enough, but when it actually transpired that the exit package wasn't compliant with the scheme and you were fully aware of that, you still went ahead and implemented that. You didn't flag it up with... with you, you knew that the, the, the rules had been broken you didn't raise it with management of any description? I, the agreement that the CFO came to with um, the Director General was that what the assurance that I was given was that the cost savings would be achieved. And I had no reason not to believe that. But at that st yes, but further on, when you were given the instruction, as you said in your opening mm -hmm. statement, when you were given the instruction to go ahead with the scheme, you knew at that stage that there was no possible chance of the 80% savings being made because... Um, the new CEO was being instated, so the, the role hadn't been suppressed. So you knew all no, that. So the, the terms of the 2017 scheme were very different to the terms of the 2021 scheme. Yes. But you knew, you but, knew at this, don't play with words, you knew at that stage that what you're being asked to sign off on wasn't yeah. correct, but you did it. I signed off on an instruction. It was yes. the... But you knew, my question is... You knew that instruction. You knew there was something wrong with that instruction. It didn't sit comfortable with you. Even if you'd given the benefit of doubt initially, it was now in black and white that procedures weren't being followed and rules were being broken and you signed off on it. The rule that was broken was that the Director General did not bring it to the executive. But you, you're the head of HR. So that was but your responsibility to make sure in your department that things were done right and lot, rules weren't broken and procedures were adhered to and schemes weren't, you know, cut up for, for individuals. That two, was your job as Director of Human Resources. Am I correct in saying that? 203 people went through the proper process, all of which have been no, verified No, no, we're by talking McCann. about, you've said it in your opening statement, that's what I'm referring to. We're talking about this particular package where rules were broken, things were overlooked, and you as head of HR didn't flag it up with management. Well, the ultimate decision maker was my manager. Okay, so you had said that, you also said this type of single line approval could not happen now. But it wasn't supposed to happen then either. It was supposed to have board approval. No, but she was the... the no, there's the a board. board. That's why I keep yeah. asking. You didn't flag it up with management. Anyone else in management, you didn't flag executive. it up with board. No. Right, so it was supposed to happen then and it didn't. And you are in part responsible for that because you didn't, you're aware of it, you're a part of it, you were involved in it, but you didn't flag it up with anybody. I wasn't part of it. You were involved in it. You were involved in it. You've said it here yourself. Yeah, of course you were involved in yes. it. So you said then that the exit of the former C CFO was processed in the same way as all others. She received the standard letter, which included the wording as approved by the wording as approved by the executive board. This, you said, is an administrative oversight and it's one you take full responsibility. I have to say, like uh, Deputy Griffin made reference to that uh, paragraph too. I've heard of, of downplaying something, but I mean, that, that takes the biscuit. I mean, there was a, that was the third stage 
where you actually could have flagged it up and you actually signed that form that stated in black and white as approved by the executive board when you knew full well, 100%, this was not approved. And don't talk rubbish about a standard that was the standard letter. If you were doing your job as director of HR, you could have said, I can't sign that because it says I was approved by the executive board. If I signed that, I would be party to a lie. That's the point I make, and I'm telling you the truth. It no, was. You, you, you know what I'm telling you the truth. You're downplaying was. the fact. Yeah, but my point is that at no stage did you intervene as head of HR. At no stage did you speak up and say what has been done here is wrong. So my next question is, and I'm, believe me when I say I'm trying to understand here. My next question is, were you afraid of D Forbes? Were you afraid of questioning her? Were you afraid of, you know, tackling her on this? Were you afraid of her? I had, no, I had no reason not to trust that the savings wouldn't be That's made. That's not my question. I asked because of what we've just gone through, where there was three different opportunities for you to speak up, and each one you said, I didn't question it, that was, she was the head book cat. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you, in your position as director of HR, were you afraid to question D Forbes? I wasn't afraid of D Forbes. You weren't afraid of her. You absolutely weren't. So that means then, that is clear enough then. That means that you just didn't do your job. You weren't afraid to question her. You knew what she was doing was wrong and you did not do your job. That's, that's, the, that's it in a nutshell. Mr. Backhurst, what do you think on hearing that? That a member of your executive board hadn't done their job, wasn't afraid to hold the former director general to account, just didn't do her job? Yeah, I've spoken... And then, mm. and just, just to say, we're talking about trust. Yeah. Now, the public hear this and they're going to see that that executive is still on the board, yeah. still in the same position, and has literally no excuse for not doing their job, was complicit in this all the way along. Yeah, I, d I don't think, um, I've spoken to Ema about this a lot. Um, I think Ema recognises she did question it, she probably should have questioned it more. I think it's important to remember that um, this was the chief executive to someone who joined the organisation a relatively short time, instructing her to do it, and instructing her working with the CFO, who was a peer of Ema's at the time, who was overseeing financial aspects of the scheme. I think Ema recognises that this shouldn't have happened. I would say one thing, Deputy, um, which is, from what I have discovered about RT, this is the way the organisation was run, in a siloed way, with decisions being taken outside of the normal routes, avoiding governance, not going through the executive, not going to board when they yeah, should. I'm, just, I'm going to just... just Sorry, yeah, I don't want I to go. I know you've got you're 10 saying. minutes. Yeah, yeah time yeah, is yeah, of the, yeah. the essence here. That's all fair and dandy. But it comes back to trust. It comes back to people having confidence. Mm -hmm. And I suspect with somebody who just didn't do their job, mm -hmm. as, we've, as we've just discovered mm -hmm. now in black and white, um, that there was this thinking in those in the highest positions in RTE that's these things would never come into the public domain. They'd never come to light. Mm. Nobody was ever going to question it. But when you come back to trust mm. and have building that confidence, for the public to see that people who didn't do their job at that time sat there, said nothing, didn't see, didn't mm. say, been at this committee several times and the other committee, never spoke up, never told us what we've discovered today, and they're still on the executive board. Can I just say, just put this in a, try and put this in a little bit of context, and I'll try and be quick, because I know you're watching the clock. There were 427 exits or applications for voluntary exits examined by McCann Fitzgerald. There was a single one that did not meet the standards required. There was questions with tax compliance on 10 others, I think, wasn't yeah, there? But, yes, but yeah, well, there are questions, yes, yeah, and we, yeah. we're talking to revenue about that. This we'll, is all about, you see, and I come back to yeah. it again. Mm. This is all about what sticks in the public's craw. Can is I, that yeah. people mm. are never held accountable. So can I... Can I people are looking now mm. and saying, this person who's head of HR, director of HR, is still on the executive board, no consequences. So I'll try and answer that. There have been consequences at the most senior level in RTE. You'll have seen I've taken action. Right, consequences in, in relation to the director of human resources. There have been not... consequences at executive level. I judge each individual case on its merits. Ema made a mistake. She said that in this case. The one thing I would say is I have worked with many heads of HR in my time. Ema is an extremely good of HR, head of HR. She is delivering change and fairness across the organisation. Okay, I just beg to differ and just say okay. it wasn't a mistake in, in my opinion. It was seeing a wrong 
and not putting it right in our position. I just want to move on just to the, um, the next fiasco, the, the toy show, <coughs> and um, the head of the Audit and Risk Committee, um, Ms O'Leary. Just um, at the meeting on the 28th of April, um, I think Moya Doherty is quoted in the Grant Thornton report as saying that every board member had the opportunity to ask questions, raise objections, or disapprove of the project. Is that not true? It is not true. Um, okay. you, you've got to look at the meeting that was organised for the 29th of March 2002, which is called the Combo Meeting. It was presented as a fait accompli. There was no okay. financial information given to us before. So was that the first time you heard of it? That, Absolutely. That the Combo it, Meeting, was it? And one of the things... And did you question anything at that meeting, the Combo Meeting? Just to clarify a point, please. Even the invitation said... Um, the no, I'm, look, no, forget no, no, the invitation. No, 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 We're just no, 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 time is of the essence. Okay, the really invitation important. is irrelevant. Would, no, There's a combo like, meeting. No, 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 so when did you went? First forget time, the script. Forget no, no, the script. The, the first time I had heard about it was at that meeting. Uh, right. And also, I so did you ask questions at that? I did because right. Moya Doherty told me that she had made sure that um, Julian Erskine had been, who was an ex River Dance. Um, a, a producer or director was now part of that team, and it was a complete surprise to me. So, so you were you were shocked. So, what questions did you ask? I asked I asked a very simple question actually, but it wasn't documented. I know the late late uh, studio is really small. I kept thinking. I so I said to her, "Why would you choose the convention centre? Would you not try and go for a theatre like the Gaiety or something and try it out first? So and that was your so question as. And the chair of one, the audit and risk one committee. Of my right. The that, other you said you asked one question. What was the other one? The other questions were: When are we going to get the risk analysis? When are we going to get the the um, financial model? When are we going to get the full briefing document? Before I say any more, there so is when a you were asked about when we were going to get the risk analysis. Yeah. Assessment, where, or when did it come before yourself? And Why the answer is it didn't. There is an executive no. meeting that was held on the 1st of March 2022 uh, where a finance and risk analysis was done. And the meeting minutes from that executive meeting was that now this needs to be brought to the audit and risk. It never came to the audit so and risk. So you're the chair of the audit and risk. So at that stage you knew there was something... Again, you knew there was something afoot that you know it hadn't been there hadn't it hadn't been financially assessed it hadn't there hadn't been proper risk management done. You weren't talking about top and safety, extra piece of furniture for Fair City on the on the. No, no, you got. You're talking me, about you, something that's massive. So just when let, did just let me answer, okay? The the executive meeting was the first of March 2022. The combo meeting wasn't until the 29th of March. 2002, mm. a number of people from the Audit and Risk kept asking Rory Coveney and <coughs> he, who were the sponsoring um, executives, and Moya Doherty, when we were going to get financial information. It was put in as part of the pack, as part of the board pack on the May um, board meeting, right. and that's all. And so what did you do at that stage? What did you do, do then? At that stage, they had already the tickets had been announced from RTE on the 13th or um, the late late on the 13th of May, and had been announced to the public, and the tickets were for sale. So, because of, for example, say whatever it, whatever happened with the meetings and the combo meeting and the 1st of March and the 16th of March, and the, the at the end of the day, you're the chair of the Audit and Risk Committee, and it's it's your, your job, your task with risk assessment, asking questions, probing, oversight. That's your job, no, right? It's, that's it's that's job, your job. It's the job of the sponsoring executive to bring to the audit yes. risk committee. But it's also you to be proactive when you know there's something of this magnitude and going we on. Kept, we that kept, but we you, kept asking for it. Right. So what happened was, because of the lack of, say, oversight or the pressing of questions, or you being <sighs> across it and on top of it all, we had a cost to the taxpayer of 2.3 million for a flop because there was no risk assessment done, there was no proper oversight done, and that was all under your watch. Well, I, I think, um, Deputy, that's a little unfair in that there is a rigorous process in place in RTE about how projects are supposed to get approval for funding or not. So and what in happened? my time, it was the, the um, sponsoring executives uh, Rory Coveney and Dee Forbes deliberately circumvented that procedure. I can list out the 32 Did projects. Did you bring it to anybody else in management or the, the executive board or 
Well, the people we referred to. You just go along with it. Not at all. We referred to Rory Coveney and Dee right. Singh. But when you didn't get, get a response from them, what did you do then as chair of the time, Audit and Risk Committee? Absolutely, in 10 seconds, yeah. Ms O'Leary. When you didn't get a response from D Forbes or, or Mr Coveney, where I, did you go to then as chair I of went, the Audit and Risk? I went to the chairwoman herself and I kept being told this is this has been done and dusted. It's going to be one of the best things that's ever happened to RTE. It's going to be a huge commercial success. You have to remember that in the November board meeting and the October board meeting, Richard Collins gave us the projections that it was going to make a 300,000 profit. So in good faith, I listened to them. I assumed that they were doing. They're full-time executives. Not a good you know the people in the board. Out to be we're part-time. We all have full-time jobs doing other things. We only get to spend two to three days a month on doing this. I kept asking the question, and in good faith, in good faith, I'm oh, to be a bit them. more thorough than good faith. Senator having good Byrne, faith. Senator Byrne, the floor.